Hello and welcome to the Wicked Things Podcast. Haven, the story of lightning is one of the few story series created specifically for younger listeners. This is a fast-paced story full of magic, conspiracy, fantasy, talking animals, and exploration of a primeval world that awaits the listener, we hope you enjoy. Robert was the first to reach his destination. However, he was emotionally unprepared for what awaited him there. The wolves had destroyed the camp, no doubt under Shadow's orders. He approached with caution, as he was suspicious that wolves remained behind to catch survivors, or worse. He entered the camp from the side closest to the beach. This placed him opposite the command tent that contained the radio. This put him close to the supply tent, which worked for him, as he hoped to arm himself against the wolves. Robert pulled the flap of the supply tent open. A look of disbelief held firm on his face as he discovered the remains of the broken boxes and crates that once held the expedition team's supplies. Robert sighed loudly. They destroyed everything. He sifted through the debris, looking for anything he could salvage. Beneath the piles, he found a familiar shape and smiled, withdrawing a sheep's hoof 12-inch knife. Robert stood to better examine the knife. He was happy. The knife should serve him well in the conflict to come. He had not eaten in some time, and his stomach grumbled loudly. Robert spotted the shredded tent that used to be the cook's tent. Hope they left something. He held the knife at the ready as he crossed the camp to the cook's tent. Halfway to the tent, a sound from the woods startled him near the commander's tent. Robert studied the area for a long time before continuing to the cook's tent. He was not foolish. It's never just the wind. He threw open the cook's tent flap and the sensation of disappointment took hold of Robert once again. The interior matched the walls of the tent. Almost nothing remained. Water containers knocked over or punctured, with their contents long passed on to the earth below. They tore apart the once massive sacks of food, and the contents lay strewn about the floor. They had consumed most of the food. What remained was hardly scraps. Robert's focus and disappointment held his attention on the tent's interior. This poor choice did not allow him to see the creeping form moving from beyond the fire. The approaching wolf was a tracking expert that knew exactly how to find the best angle for an attack. Robert found two apples and smiled. He made the remains of a burlap sack into a pouch to hold the apples. As he stood, he discovered a single metal canteen that remained unmolested and seized it. Robert left the cook's tent and walked directly to the command tent. He pulled the antenna tops from his pocket and cleaned it. He carefully examined the threads inside it that held it onto the antenna. Robert walked, stopping outside the command tent to attach the top before entering. The wolf entered the tent to determine what the human had done inside. It sniffed inside and looked through the remains. It left the tent a moment later, happy to see the man had only taken the apples. Robert finished outside the command tent and threw back the tent flap. He immediately fell to his knee as his deepest fear laid scattered across the command tent's floor. The wolves had torn apart the men who he had arrived with and served with for the past few years. They had piled the remains of the six men three of which were soldiers, inside, atop the expedition commander's bed. The blood from their broken bodies slowly pooled on and below the mattress. Most of their internal organs had tumbled below the mattress. Robert was pulled from his stupor, hearing static from the radio. He was in shock it still worked. He rushed to the box and cranked its generator to charge the battery. After several turns of the handle, the radio's volume rose quickly. Wolf moved silently out of the cook's tent and to the command tent. It bared its fangs as part of its approach. It found Robert's scent causing him to salivate at the thoughts of eating this man.
Robert placed the headphones on his head and opened the operator's book on the nearby stand. He flipped frantically through the book, looking for the entry that would give him the signal strength and channels used by the ship to stay in contact with the doomed expedition team. Robert's face filled with excitement as he found the entry he needed. He set his knife down and lifted the book into better light. He dialed in the signal strength and looked around, making sure he was alone. He then set the radio to the listed channel and looked over his shoulder, still ensuring that he was alone. The radio crackled again, and he could hear part of a human voice. He closed his eyes to focus his senses on hearing as he adjusted the knobs and dials to better sync up the reception. Hello, can you hear me? He yelled into the microphone. Robert's shifting of focus did not allow him to notice the beastly wolf standing in the tent opening. The massive black and brown wolf released a blood-curdling growl. This pulled Robert's attention back to the moment. He grabbed his knife and was on his feet in a flash of movement. Robert and the beast were suddenly on the floor, in the fight of their lives. Slick and Slicker were next to arrive at their destination thanks in part to a brief encounter with Scout, who told them that Shadow and the wolves had moved their hostages. Scout told them they stopped near the Animal Council's chambers. They quietly approached the sacred redwood as they could hear the sounds of many voices. They remained quiet and stayed upwind from the gathered masses. Slicker pointed to his ear, shook his head, and shrugged, Slick motioned for his brother to stay close and follow him. The twins circled halfway around the clearing next to the sacred redwood stump. Slicker pointed to a large corral holding the unicorns. Found it! Slicker motioned to one of the many wolves and shrugged. Great, but how are we going to help them now? Slick rubbed his chin and thought for a moment. Slick snapped the thumb and finger on the hand rubbing his chin. I got it! Let's go! Slick dashed off towards the backside of the corral. Slicker shook his head and gave chase. Slick stopped next to the corral and smiled. He turned to face his brother and tapped against his temple as he grinned mischievously. Go into the underbrush, make noises, and then kick out your shiny ball. The wolves will be all over it, which will give us the time we need, Slick demanded. Slicker lowered his head and dove into the underbrush near the clearing. Slick waited patiently as he moved to a small corner of overgrown vines that clung to the outside of the corral. He smiled, hearing Slicker starting the distraction. He rustled the bushes, yelled, and as the wolves rushed at the underbrush, he kicked the shiny ball out between the assembled pack. The wolves rushed at the ball. Kill it! growled the lead wolf. He opened his mouth and slammed it shut around the ball. His teeth exploded from his mouth as they impacted the middle spear. The rest of the pack stopped dead in their tracks, seeing the teeth sent flying. Slicker rejoined his brother, chewing on the vines to create a hole small enough so they could get into the corral unseen. The twins made short work of the vines and were inside before the wolves pushed the metal spear toward Shadow. Unicorns and other unfortunate animals gathered around the weasels. Slick and Slicker paused for their part of the plan, seeing that the unicorns were not alone in the corral. Slick looked worried to his brother. Wasn't it supposed to be the unicorns alone in here? An injured rabbit approached. It started out that way. But many of us came to support Tremere. The rabbit lowered her head and stared at the ground. He butchered her, his own daughter, and forced us to watch, just to make an example out of her. Slick and Slicker found themselves without a word for such villainy. A unicorn approached, glared at the twins, and spoke low. You need to be quiet, or they'll feed another one of us to the wolves. The twins agreed and noted everyone inside the corral. We need to get everyone out of here. Slick studied the corral for weakness. What do you suggest? They injured most, or worse. Slicker pointed to the eviscerated remains of Shadow's daughter, Tremere. 
I I'm sorry, I don't know. Thorn lied openly to the unicorns about his involvement as he stood next to Tremere. He was surrounded by enraged unicorns, ready to run him through and eat his heart. You didn't know. You didn't know? Shadow said you chose right before using his power to set the wolves on her. Thorn ran from the unicorns and hid behind Slick and Slicker. Oh no, you don't, Slicker announced. Keeper told us all about your plan to promote her to lead. Not even knowing the island had already chosen the line of alphas, from the first to the last. He looked up at the twins and tumbled to the ground. None of us thought the magic was real, until Shadow showed us. Wiser hopped forward, her left wing broken in multiple places. You lied to us, Thorn. From the beginning, you told us magic was fake. You told us we should select the unicorn's next alpha, not them. You told us it was in our best interest to make them accountable to us. You then brainwashed Tremere into believing your nonsense. Wiser spoke in uncharacterized anger and rage. Now look what you've done. She motioned to Tremere's lifeless body. So then you find yourself at the wolf's teeth, and then what do you do? She demanded. Thorn's guilt was obvious in his every action and refusal to make eye contact. For once, take responsibility for your choices. Quit making the rest of the world carry your burden. She lifted him by the throat, clenched tightly in her talons. Slick and Slicker shrugged. Dude, you're so on your own. If this is all true, you need to live with your poor decisions. The injured rabbit motioned for everyone to be quiet as she pointed at the wolves. Shadow looked down at the wolves. What? We found this. The wolf pushed the metal ball toward Shadow's hoof. He examined it and snarled. His eyes turned to the corral. The twins are here. Find them. Kill them. The wolves flooded into the corral, bringing more pain and injury in their wake. Striper was close enough to the sacred redwood stump she could hear Shadow's demand of the wolves. Good luck, guys. Keep moving. Lightning and Keeper will be here soon. She lowered her head and moved towards the location where Scout told her thunder and rain were being held. Just a little further, she thought as she sped through the forest. Striper exploded out of the forest and rushed along the shoreline. After several minutes, she could see the cliffs that supposedly contained thunder and rain. The prison cave was close to the beach, which meant that it would flood and kill them during the next change of the tide. Striper pumped her legs as fast as they would take her. She crossed the distance and paused at the cave entrance long enough to catch her breath. She struggled for breath after crossing the island in an hour rather than a few days. Striper leaned against the mouth of the cave, but found herself assaulted by a stench. She realized the odor and ran into the cave. No, God, no! She fell to her knees upon entering and seeing what she had fought so hard to stop from happening. Wasn't that terrific? I can hardly wait for the next episode. This is the Wicked Things Podcast signing off. Until next time, goodbye.